Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Today, I want to touch doctrine. Somebody shout Amen. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 6, the Bible says, Jesus gets his disciples and tells them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we've taken no bread? Because when they crossed over to the sea, they had forgotten to carry bread. So when Jesus tells them, Take heed of the living of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the disciples of Jesus Christ think that he is saying that they have forgotten to carry bread. And uh, the Bible says, And then Jesus perceived that, and he told them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because that you have brought no bread? He says, Do you not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, how many baskets you took up? Don't you remember that I fed you before when you did not carry food? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets you took up? I've done that before. I've done miracles of feeding you when you don't have bread. So I'm not talking about bread. And how is it that you do not understand that I spoke not to you concerning bread, but I should be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? And then they understood how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and all the Sadducees, the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is what he was talking about. He was warning them about teaching. Many times in scripture, we see that Jesus says certain things and people pick others, okay? We've seen many times in scripture where Jesus said something and the disciples or the people that were following along understood a different matter from what the Lord was saying. And so we see many times men that are getting lost in context and communication because they have not fully understood what Jesus is saying concerning a particular matter. Are you with me? And so there's a lot of danger to that. There's a lot of danger to that more than I can share with you now but I will in due time uh, when we touch this. So today I want to touch the issue of doctrine. In Galatians chapter 5, and the whole Galatians actually, Paul introduces a conversation touching the church in Galatia, an observation in the church of Galatia. He sees people who begin well in God, walk well in God, and then over time he starts to see them slip into something else strange. Okay? And then he starts to get concerned that these people who began well are going a certain way. He's observing that he gave them God, he taught the gospel. But then over time something is changing on them and they're starting to take another teaching, another doctrine, another way of life, another pattern of worship and another interpretation of the things of God. And then Paul gets so concerned. Okay? And he begins in Galatians 5, 1, where he says that in this freedom Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. And then he tells the church, therefore, stand then and do not be hampered and held and snared and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off. He's telling them, look, when you receive Jesus Christ, you become born again. When you become born again, you are born into freedom. You are born into a completion of Christ that liberates you. And he tells you, therefore, do not be hampered and held ensnared. This ensnaring is in a hampering. Okay? There's a way it persuades. There's a way it manipulates slowly. It draws you unknowingly because it carries a sweetness in the bitter intention. Okay? And he says, do not be hampered and ensnared and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off. In other words, at what point was this yoke of slavery put off? Was it put off because one went through a deliverance service and says, I put off everything that is holding me? No, 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 no. This putting off happens at the time of your salvation, at the transition from darkness to light. For the Bible says in Corinthians, for if any man, any, 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 whether he was born by which doctor father, whether he was born by a judge's judge, who was in the witch doctor, who was committed to be the next in line for the witchcraft, he says, if any man be in Christ, the Bible says he is a new creature. And it says, and old 
things are passed away and behold things are become new and he says and all things are of God that means when you become born again everything about your generational curses generational spirits inherited demon hereditary diseases your grandfather had high blood pressure you have it to your uncle and then he's all carried diabetes and so diabetes is in your genes you know it's in your genes don't do all that is good you are dealing with a new creation so because you are dealing with a new creation and all things are passed away it means that that point of darkness into light is your imminent deliverance okay so a christian begins on that and at that point they are free okay and then somebody brings a doctrine and says you know when you get born again you cross over with some things Ah, wait, what things? You know, for example, the generational curses, for is the God who curses to the third and fourth generation of them that hate him. Do I hate him? No, but your grandfather's hated him. So then am I paying the price of my grandfather? Yes. So what does the scripture say when he says that in that day men shall not eat sour grapes and that teeth of the children are set on the edge. Okay, so if the Bible says it shall not be said anymore that the fathers have eaten of sour grapes and the teeth of their children are set on the edge. So if the Bible says I'm not supposed to pay for the sin of my father, why are you even talking about that to me who is a new creation? The old things have passed away and all are new and all are of God. All are of God. So what part do I cross with in the generational curse that is inside that all of God? The truth is nothing. And then Christians go through deliverances of devils that have actually been put into them by doctrine and ignorance by doctrine and what and ignorance and so this is the warning paul is giving in galatians 5 that do not be ensnared and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off how are you putting it off you've put it off by putting off the old man and putting on the new man which is jesus is the reality of your faith somebody shout hallelujah so Later on, Paul continues to explain the various doctrines within the church that are sort of ensnaring the church back into bondage in Galatia. And then he says in verses 7, after mentioning all of these things, he says, you were running the race nobly. You were okay from the beginning. He said, who has interfered in and hindered and stopped you from heeding and following the truth? Underline following the truth. And he says, this evil persuasion, this evil seduction is not from him who called you, who invited you to freedom in Christ. This is something else. And he continues to say, a little living, a slight inclination to error, or a few false teachers, leavens the whole lamp. He says it perverts the whole conception of faith or misleads the whole church. How much can I emphasize to you the importance of the sermon that a little living, a little, can pervert the whole conception of faith. One message can destroy a whole ministry. And I cannot tell you how many people have been perverted and they don't even know that they are perverted because they don't even know what's perverse. The only thing that we all can agree on is that we are living in a life of powerless Christianity. Many Christians do not have power in their lives. They're not moving with a certain level of glory on their lives. And many of them, when you search out, there's a doctrine in there that was planted and has deluded them for years. Because what happens? Man-made doctrines. Things that are not of God planted in you make the word of God in your life without effect. And that's the reason why we have Christians who are always taught, they're being taught every day, but they're not coming to that knowledge. They're not changing. They're not being transformed. They are praying, but they're not seeing answers. Because in spite of their prayer, their unbelief, they are doubting the space that kills their faith in them was a doctrine that was planted sometime back in their lives and they don't even know. That means one summon off can kill you. A little living can destroy the whole church, a whole ministry. The message version says, For you were running superbly, who cut you in on you, deflecting you from the true course of obedience? 
following the truth. He says, this detour doesn't come from the one who called you into the rest in the first place. And he says, and please don't toss this off as insignificant. It only takes a minute amount of yeast, and you know, and it permits the entire loaf of bread. Don't take this lightly. Don't take it lightly that many people are struggling, striving, suffering because of certain things that were planted in their lives and they will never have results in their ministry until certain things change within their lives. Oh, Apostle, I've prayed, I've believed, I've done all this. Why is it that I don't see the results that I'm supposed to be believing? There is probably a doctrine that was planted in the inside of you and it was sent in there as a cancer to kill your faith. To kill your faith. And that is why, allow me to talk about that level of witchcraft. Because every time we talk about witchcraft in the church, many people think witchcraft as of guys who go and tick, 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 and then they go to a black sorcerer person and then they tell him, I want you to make Joshua shorter, make him shorter, you understand? And then they start tick, 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 and then shorter, shorter, bring me his picture, and then they shorten Joshua, you understand? No. That kind of witchcraft is so easy to deal with and design because you can tell darkness and light. Easy. You can tell darkness and light easy in that level. But then what do you do with a witchcraft that comes through doctrine? That is why when Paul sees the change of this doctrine, he ardently, from his heart, stresses and says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey again the truth? In five, he says that you have not followed the truth. In three, he says that you have not obeyed the truth. You know that this spirit counters truth. It's against truth. Are you hearing me? It is anti-truth. And Christ is truth. So it's anti-Christ. It's against the spirit of truth. And Paul calls this witchcraft. And I can tell you, a lot of men are doing witchcraft on the altars. They are rebuking the other one, but yet they are establishing another. And so we have a lot of witchcraft today in the church. Why? Because it puts an athema, it places a curse on a man and changes their course. And now Satan does not need to cast them. He can teach them out of the true course into the wrong one. Because we have many Christians, by the way, who have not yet separated they have not yet learned to see the realities of truth. Everyone who speaks a sentence they had in church speaks exactly like their pastor. Do you know it? You make one sentence and say, that's exactly those are great. You understand? But no, not because somebody has made a statement, I mean that they are, it's like somebody offended me some time back, okay? I was offended. I'll tell you why. This guy finds me and says, eh. You preach like this person. They mention a guy who I don't preach like. I cut a wire in my heart. Yeah? But here, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, but inside there I was offended. Why? Because the guy they say I speak like. If I tell you the name, eh, some of you might even fall off the chairs laughing. I don't know why this dude said I speak like that. But for him when I spoke, he says, you speak like. I said, yeah, yes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because there are people who think all pastors speak the same message. All ministers teach the same message. All pastors teach the same sermon. You spoke exactly what my pastor was speaking yesterday. <laughs> and I'm like, I wish some people understand that it's the spirit that teaches. It's the spirit that teaches. It's not the words that are articulated. I can speak like your pastor, but my spirit will minister from another place. Are you hearing me? And so I was disturbed because the person I was compared to, when I hear them speaking, I don't even agree with some of their doctrines. So I realize this person even doesn't know. You know, when you're a baby, yeah, like the Bible says in Scripture, there are mass many teachers around them seeking to speak what they're eating ears. When you're a baby, everyone can teach you. And as you're younger, you realize that, for example, if you have internet, eh? ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. you'll have like preachers on YouTube. Eh? You know people, oh, oh, is it? now what is this I'm saying? You understand that? Eh? Why? Because you're hungry. Your ears are eating for something. But you notice as you're growing older, you start telling the difference. 
you hear guys speaking, one don't YouTube and but this guy one mm, red light. You understand? You start to see your YouTube preachers reducing. Have you noticed that? You see that you don't listen to certain people who you couldn't even live without. It starts to reduce slowly, slowly. And then you start focusing on a particular one. It's something you grow into. That is not something you tell someone to stop. You can't tell a babe to stop searching. You understand? Because when you're a baby, they will go everywhere. Electricity, what? Then they get the wire. Then they pull. Hey, don't go there. You carry them and then put them here. I said, sit here. But because they're babies. Everything that makes them curious. I understand. Eh? Everything they get, they put in the what? In the mouth. Because they're babies. They eat everything. They eat everything. But as you grow, you separate food from plastic. Yeah. You understand? So, your teachers reduce. They start reducing as you grow. Because you test the spirit. When you talk about testing the spirit, eh, some people are taught in a way to be on guard of seeing any false thing. <laughs> test. No. <laughs> That's not testing the spirit. <laughs> Testing the spirit is a certain lens that is put on your precision of vision. And you start to see through the eyes of truth. And when the Lord told me how to test the spirit years ago, I could tell a babe from a deluded one. I could tell, like someone could come and prophesy, and they're accurate one part and the other part, they're not accurate. And they're not false prophets. But I could tell that they're just a learning prophet. And I could know how to take the good and then leave the other. You understand? And I could meet people who are so accurate, and I could tell that this, in all their accuracy, is not speaking through the eye of the prophet, the true eye of the prophet. I could tell. But that's another level. That's another level. Because some people think, oh, the more accurate, the more prophetic someone is. No. Jeremiah saw a sycamore tree. It took God to explain to him that actually that sycamore tree you're seeing is a bigger prophecy concerning a nation. I saw a pot boiling toward the north. And he's a prophet. But God is telling him something so big concerning the destiny of the whole nation. But then to know how to interpret and to apply for the prophet. And a man can see that. And another one with a wrong eye sees even more accurate personal stuff that is not seen from the office of a prophet. So designing of the spirit is more than just getting to know which one is bad, which is good. It's more the life that opens your eyes to walk in the spirit, to design by the spirit of truth. Eh? And so you define the spirit of truth and that spirit of truth defines the lenses through which you see things. When Paul is speaking about this witchcraft, okay, that is invaded the church, he says somebody bewitched the church in Galatia. And that is why in verses 5, he says, This particular persuasion is not from him who called you, who invited you to freedom in Christ. He says, this particular one is from somewhere else. That's why he's asking, who hindered you? He's trying to understand. Who brought this doctrine? In other words, it permeated the church of Galatia that it was even so hard to identify who started it. Because the living went moving into the door. Are you following what I'm saying? It went permeating through but they could not identify who. And that's why I tell people that it takes a little statement. A man can stand on the pulpit and make one statement and teach a particular doctrine and put something on a believer that would hold them in poverty for the rest of their lives until the truth comes. Someone can bring a doctrine and put it in a church and create poverty on the lives of men for years. Families affected, careers affected, people destroyed because of poverty, lives getting into the wrongest relationships because of poverty, families lost because of poverty, because one man taught a doctrine that is off. Someone can teach something that can trigger sin in a ministry he doesn't know how to teach. Sometimes some people don't know. Some do it ignorantly. And some, of course, are sent deliberately. 
scripture tells us. A man can make a statement and break a whole marriage institution in the ministry. One sentence, one statement out of his mind. Some of you have heard of a fellow, I'll not mention his name and ministry because in this ministry, this altar doesn't fight ministries. This is for you because I must protect you. It's my responsibility. I'll show you the scripture later. One guy said that he looked through the Bible from the beginning to the end. He's opening and open the bed, open-minded to discuss that there is no scripture in the Bible that says that a man should stay married to his wife forever. He looked through the whole Bible and failed to find a scripture that says that a man should not live. So he says, oh, why should people kill each other? No, if things don't work, divorce. There is a person in the ministry who is on the verge of divorcing his wife. And then he meets that doctrine. He's looking for a justification to walk out. She's looking for a justification to walk out. She's not walked out yet because she fears God. Then a man says, no, you know, why should you kill each other? Let me tell you, couples have wanted to kill each other for so long. They just don't kill each other. But those moments have happened in many marriages. I'm a pastor. I hear things. So, you're telling people, now you can divorce because there is no scripture. And there is like a very gullible kid or woman or man in that room who thinks, by the way, you show us the scripture. Because there are many people who don't understand that some doctrines in the church of Jesus Christ are not directly implied. Are you hearing me? Some doctrines in the church of Jesus are not directly implied. But if you get into scripture and search out well, you will find that their relevance and identification and definition is in scripture. For example, if you look for Trinity in the Bible, it's not there. Somebody can say, show me the Trinity. It's not there. So then why are you saying God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit if it doesn't exist? However, if you read the Bible, you will find that there are many instances in Scripture that give the impression of the three. Okay? God said, now let us make man in our own image. The word there is Elohim. Okay? When you read the Amplified, God said, let us. The Amplified says, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because Elohim is a plural name of God. In other words, he was not one. Then you see him defining the Father and the Son relationship. Then you see him defining the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, and these three are one. So if the Bible says these three are one, okay? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Who is the Word? Hey, who is the Word? Jesus and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. These are the Trinity. So we don't have the word Trinity in the book, but it exists. Okay? So let me answer my father, who says that there is no scripture that says a man shall live forever until he dies. Okay? The Bible says, for a husband is bound to a wife as long as he lives. Or a woman that it, who it has a husband, in Romans 7, 2, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And if the husband be dead, then she's loose from the law of her husband. What does that mean? Common sense. That as long as your husband is alive, you're bound to him. And if you are bound to him as long as he's alive until he dies, that means that you're supposed to be together forever. What are we discussing again? Show me the scripture. Show me. If I read that to him, he would not see it. But he read the Bible. Who has understood what I just said? Even if the New Testament only had one sentence, that Jesus died for all your sins, it would be, now the New Testament only has that sentence, it would be okay for us to imply that therefore we are not going to die. Even if they had not written it, we'd believe it. Why? Because the wages of sin was death. We saw what it did to man in the beginning. So then how can you say, show me a sentence 
You understand? I almost wanted to say, okay, show me in the scripture where the word iPad is. Why are you using an iPad? Now we are going to get there, where we are discussing. Mm -hmm. Show me in the scripture where the word tablet is. Show me. So why are you using a tablet to preach? Did you say tablet or Bible? <laughs> One time I was in a church back in the day, many years ago, and I was sitting next to a lady, and during that time I'd gotten a very wonderful application of a whole Bible on my phone. It was amazing. So I sit in this church, and then they tell us, so open Ephesians, so I open, as ta -ta -ta -ta, I'm scrolling around, some old woman was seated next to me like this, she looked at me. You should ask the young man, why don't you come with your Bible? <laughs> then I tell her, of course, in this fascination of Mama, you see, I have a Bible here, read. And she reads. So this is a whole Bible? I said, yeah. She says, this is not a Bible. <laughs> Next time, come with a Bible. <laughs> I told her, I'm sorry the phone back. Next time come with a Bible. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But what a believer might not know is that that one sentence can kill thousands, thousands of homes and raise children who are deserted by their own parents and bring divisions that will never come together again because the person chose to invent a doctrine and what of those who are just watching you understand what i'm saying that's how you know that a big percentage of the church does not read the word because some things are so obvious so obvious are you hearing me? They are so what? So obvious. They ask, why are men deceived easily? Why is it so easy to dissuade a man, to persuade a man, to seduce a man? The Bible says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9, in the Amplified Version, when he's talking about the spirit of Antichrist or the lawless one. He says, the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is through the activity and working of Satan. This is Satan deliberate. And the Bible says, and will be attended by great power and with all sorts of pretended miracles and signs and delusive marvels, all of them lying wonders. And I tell people, how then do you think Satan can come to play stage, to be a stage actor and not act some miracles and not do some signs and delusive marvels, delusive marvels, because there are people who are simply taken by a marvel. Anything that was, oh, oh my God. You understand what I'm saying? One young man was sent a video of a fellow who claimed to be walking in air. And this young man said, the moment I saw that video, I could not eat for three days. And it turned out to be fake. Later, it was proved that the video was fake. So I looked at this young man and I said in my head, you spent three days without eating because you saw a man of God walking in air. And after they prove it is fake and you discover it is fake, have you examined yourself to ask what is really wrong with you that you can fast for three days on a delusion? I couldn't eat for three days. And I imagine like a fellow in the presence of God saying, And his head is telling him, if there is a man in the world who is walking on... And after some time, they proved to the fellow that it was fake. What did that do to him? And such people, when you show them that it's fake, they will refuse to believe that it's fake. Because the delusion can take over a man that even what's obvious stops to become what? How they are seduced. So he speaks and says, this is a work 
deliberately of Satan. And the next verse says, And by unlimited seduction to evil with all wicked deception, for those who are perishing, going to perdition, because, eh, remember, they did not welcome the truth, but refused to love it that they might be saved. And therefore God sends upon them a misleading influence, a working of error and a strong delusion to make them believe what is false. Now there, when the Bible says God sent them, in other words, he allows a misleading influence over them because he's not the author of evil, but he allows a misleading influence, a working of error and a strong delusion to make them believe what is false. Why? Why does God let a man believe? I thought he's the one supposed to come in and say, hey, don't believe this. Because what he has given to the man to stay sober, the man has refused, and that is the love of truth. The love of truth. How do you tell a lover of truth? A lover of truth communes with truth. That's a lover of truth. How do I know that you are a lover of truth? How many people here, in your weekday, open the Bible and read and study against the someone that you heard? All for yourself. That means you are in a target already and can be deceived any time. At least be as fair as the Bereans, he says, who when they heard the word, they went out and searched out these things to know if they are so. You look at people who are easily deluded. They are not Bible readers. They don't love the word. They don't love the word. They're not lovers of truth. And when a man cannot love truth, God will let you be misled into a very crazy work of error. And because of that, you get into a strong delusion that you will find yourself believing what is not true. And many people have been set off their true courses because of that. Many more than you think. A man attacked me for five years on the internet. Five years. He's an apostle in town. Five years. Five. One, two, three, four, five. And when he did attack me for five years, I never answered anything. I never touched him. I never talked about him. I never said anything about his ministry. For five years, this guy has been attacking me. A very old man in this country, twice my age, he attacked me. A father who could have even called me and said, I don't agree with this, let's have a discussion. He attacked me. And so recently, I have a friend of mine, we say, you know what, why don't we try to look for these men to make a difference between the sincerely ignorant and the deliberately rebellious. Let's do that. Okay? Because the Bible says in Zechariah that I shall turn the hearts of fathers unto their children and the hearts of their children to the fathers. So I said, okay. We wrote a group of some of these men who attacked me in town. And... I paid for a hotel. Secretly, he sat. We invited this man. He came for one whole hour and abused me for one whole hour. And after that, he said, I'm not even going to stand here because if people just hear that I'm here, he might use my name and my name might justify his ministry. And there was another one also with him there who also took another first 45 minutes speaking every kind of false stuff about me. And I'm listening. I have paid for even their bill. So, as he's leaving, we tell him, yes, we have had you. Can you come back again? And we continue. They invited him again. Second day, he came. Sat. One whole hour. And he just comes and hits and goes. Then, after that, one of those days he spoke, and after that, the guy who is mediating said, can we give Apostle a chance to speak? The second one didn't even want to come back because I was so evil. They gave me a few minutes. I spoke for about 30 minutes. After speaking, the man that had abused me for five years came to me and said, I thought I knew God. Okay. and he went into his pocket and gave me a seed and said brother I'm sorry now the one who didn't come back during that time for me seemed like 
he would understand more. But I found that that one was even more wicked than this one. Because both were attacking, but this one was worse. He was hitting on Facebook every time. He went in many meetings to speak about me. You know why? Because the Lord told me, you're fathering this generation. And because you're fathering this generation, because it's the hearts of fathers to children first and the hearts of children to fathers. Now, if the heart of a father has not turned to the child, if the child goes to the father, he comes back a father. I got it. I said, okay. So who is the child? So I said, let me go to the father. I went as a son to him, but I left as a father. You get it? Why? Because what we were trying to do was to stop these walls that are hitting the church of Jesus Christ. Now, even government organizations are the ones calling pastors to tell them, stop fighting. Are you hearing me? And they're all claiming to be reading the same word. Bible. Who persuaded them that way? Who taught them that way? You know, when you're a lover of truth, I'll give you an example. There's a fellow who has been talking about me for many years. I have heard everything he has said. Unfortunately or fortunately, I know him so well that if I opened two pages of his life, his ministry will close. I am sure. Because for me, he speaks foolish lies. For me, I have proof. And I mean what I say. But because I'm a lover of truth, and I read the Bible, tells me, hold your peace. It's painful. To know how to beat a man, and he's beating you and you're not hitting back. But I love God. So I say, look, let him speak whatever he wants to speak. When he's done, he will leave me. But I will never answer him because I'm a lover of truth. If I was consumed and I refuse truth, and I refuse to follow the teachings, and I open war on him, I would put a deceptive spirit on me. And some of the men teaching false doctrine did it because they attacked certain individuals. Because every time you attack a person, you open yourself to the spirit of deception. And eventually, you'll start to look more stupid than the person you are attacking. So hold your peace. Tell your neighbor, hold your peace. Because Paul here is trying to tell us that the spirit of seduction is real and it is happening today the bible has taught us to love the word in every conversation or if asked what does the word of god say in this you're telling me be a lover of truth the spirit of seduction is killing people's destinies every day and they don't know let me define something for you if you're writing. Any conviction based on reason and thought with no consideration of divine principle is in all forms an intense seduction. Did you hear that? Any conviction based on reason and thought with no consideration of divine principle is in all forms an intense seduction. It doesn't matter how much reasonable you're saying it. It doesn't matter how thoughtful you're saying it. It doesn't matter how much you claim to be convicted by God. If it is against divine principle, you're being seduced. You're being seduced. Let me give you an example. If a brother wrongs you, what does the Bible say? Answer me. What does the Bible say? Go and tell him his word. Is for between you and him alone. Is that what the truth says? Are you a lover of truth? So if somebody wrongs you, what do you do? Go to them. Now, if somebody wrongs you, and then you go on the internet and publicize it before you go to them alone, what have you done? Hmm? 
And then a man says, you know, I was convicted by the spirit to expose these false prophets. Yeah. Okay. He's false. Did he hurt you? Yes. Did you tell him his fault between you and him alone? No. So if you went beyond him and you alone and have not called him for anything, and we find you on social media bashing him, conviction, yes, you claim. Reason, he's destroying many people, yes, you claim. Divine principle, call him. Now, if you have not called him, it doesn't matter how right you are, you are seducing. That's seduction, the spirit. That's Jezebel, the spirit. Simple principle. It doesn't matter how much conviction you carry. Is it in light with the word? Is it in light with the word? One time a believer did something in the ministry, and I called them and I said, look, I'm not against you going here or going there. But where you're at in the ministry, we expect that because you have leadership above you, before you do or go here, we expect you because of where you're at in leadership. You're not just someone who comes in on Sunday. The church knows you. Don't you think that by principle it was right to submit your dealings? Yes. So if you went ahead without submitting your dealings, how can you tell me that God led you out of a principle in the name of conviction? People are about to say God convicted me not to tithe for five months. <laughs> I know a woman who is weeping because a full woke up after marrying her for years. A full woke up and said, God has told me you're not supposed to be my wife. After marrying her for years, They've had even children together. They've made vows. They can fool walk up and tell this woman that God has told me you're not my wife. What? Somebody seduced the dear man. Something is seducing him. How can you tell me that you went and made vows on an altar? Five years had children, six, ten years. And then you wake up and tell someone the spirit has revealed to me that this is not my wife. Why did God let you walk on that altar? Okay, the Bible is clear on the two. If somebody makes you denounce your faith, then you can say this one is not mine. Because they are making you denounce your faith. But how can you tell me that now the realization has just come now? It's happening in the body of Christ. And he's going to leave his children confused about the God of their father for the rest of their lives. And they might never even believe him. But when you dig the cafello, he sat under a certain teaching. Somebody one time came to me weeping because her brother failed to go for a birthday party of the mother that he has not had the spirit. I said, how stupid, I'm sorry to use hard words, how stupid are Christians becoming? These words are spirit and life. The Bible says, honor your father and mother. Isn't that spirit? This fellow was breastfed by a woman, raised by a woman, taken to school by a woman, and he wakes up and has the audacity to say he has not had the spirit on celebrating his mother's birthday, so he's not going to come because he hasn't had the spirit. I met a fellow like that years ago. I asked him for a meeting, he dodged me, and then after some time later he said, you know, I'm sorry, Apostle, uh, I'm like that, you know, when I've not had the spirit, I don't meet, so... Um. Okay, so what were you telling me? I stood up and told the dude, I've also not had the spirit to talk to you. I walked out. I stood up immediately, I'm not dude, I've also not had God now. A man of God. Can I just call you? But he was, even me, I didn't hear. I walked away. It was the best thing to do. But we have people who are so spiritual that they're starting to become stupid. <laughs> By heavenly standards, stupid. Not earthly. Heavenly standards, stupid. That's no sense. Eh? That's Jezebel. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. How do you tell the spirit of seduction? How do you identify it? I'll give you a few things. One, 
it is enshrouded in attractive things. The spirit of seduction is enshrouded in attractive things. It is hidden in attractive things. The attractiveness of things. There are people who are so lured by marvel and attraction that they don't think. I have a friend of mine. He always makes a statement I love. He said, I got born again with my head. And I love that he says that some Christians got born again without the brain. They left their brain when they got born again. In other words, he's trying to say, even though I'm born again, I have common sense. You get it? Some Christians don't even have common sense. Common sense. Now, when seduction hits a man, it has to come in what attracts. That's why I tell people, be slow when you're given an attractive option. Think through it and pray about it. I thank God for me because from the time I was a child, I don't easily just move by something. I don't just get fascinated. Yeah, I can see something and it's amazing, yeah, but I don't just commit myself to anything because it's nice. I'm a laggard, I'm slow. On that one, I have to take my time and first study something, then I make a decision. You understand? So even in decision making, some of my men of God will tell you, sometimes I make decisions last end time, last minute. But when I do, I have had God because I know the price of not hearing God. Very expensive. Let me tell you, the bigger a ministry becomes, the most sensitive you must be to hearing God. Because one can misleading like this can destroy your ministry to zero. And many men's ministries are gone without knowledge. There's a man whose ministry fell in a space of one year. I had a vision of that fall on one date morning. The Lord told me this movement is closing this particular year. And the servant of God does not know. And I saw the ministry go with my own eyes. And guess what? I prayed for this minister for three months. And in the third month, the Lord told me, even if you went to correct them, they will never hear you. And I watched the whole ministry go down. And I knew the spirit that was seducing the ministry. So sometimes to hear God, you know, people can say all they call hearing God. But <laughs> there are certain levels even in hearing God. Are you hearing me? And there's a point you reach and you can't be certain places without hearing God. It's not possible. It's not possible. Secondly, the spirit of seduction persuades to disloyalty. It persuades to disloyalty. There are people who are so loyal to their jobs, to their marriages, to ministries, and it finds like a very loyal fellow and puts a seed in a person and they become disloyal. I always tell people, even if you don't agree with the man of God, if he has planted a seed in your life, even in your living, live as a loyal person. Live as a loyal person. Some live without even informing. Because it's disloyalty, it's in them. And once that disloyalty happens, it doesn't happen only on the ministry. It happens in everything. Their spouses, their children, their workplaces. You study their lives and they become disloyal all through. Because they believe a lie. They're deceived. Seduction so exerts power over a person. It's pushy and controlling. Why? Because its mother is Jezebel. People who have a seductive spirit are controlling. You still go to that church? If you have an issue with the ministry and you think you've made your point, why are you controlling me? Why are you telling me where to pray from? Think. The Holy Spirit does not force men. He's not a controller. He's a leader. There's a difference. He only ministers as a man yields. He does not impose their yielding. It's not a controller. Seduction is very controlling because it's Jezebelic. It can put a guilt trip on you. So you're 
Why? Because it needs to control you. The spirit of seduction affirms a false progress, happiness, and glory. It affirms a false progress, happiness, and glory. False progress, happiness, and glory. Have you been around people who fake happiness? You know they are not happy, but they are already <laughs> happy. But you can tell that they are not happy. Have you seen it? You've been around people who, for example, date and then they break up. And then after breaking up, this girl goes on a beach. Better life after. <laughs> uh, you're seduced into deception. You're not happy. Happiness does not advertise. <laughs> progress does not advertise. The power of progress has a way of gripping the man's mind on purpose than vindication. You see, I'm happy. Let me tell you. If every happy person used to publicize it, then the world would be in trouble with the joy the Christian has. Because our joy is in the spirit. Are you hearing me? You be there and you're praying and then you start to feel something just... Well, <laughs> it's a rabakosa. <laughs> it's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Imagine if we were to publicize every time we're feeling happy. We would laugh in buses every time. We would laugh in cars all the time. When you're under the joy of the Spirit, you can't even open a phone to take a photo. You've seen them in church. Then they roll ah! You don't even have time to seek attention. Because there is a way the joy of the Spirit takes your attention. Am I speaking to somebody? But by the time you start advertising your joy, you have a problem. You're not happy. By the time you start advertising glory, there is something wanting on you. I'm telling you, when the glory of God settles on my man, huh? He doesn't need to add anything on himself. I wish some of you would enter my shoes a bit and understand. When you are under certain anointing, you're so secure in who you are that nothing outside defines your security. That is why I can wake up in the morning and put on sneakers and go and play basketball with no fear that the guy I'm playing with will look at me as an average man. He can't. They foul me also on the court. They don't foul the pan. I say, wait, I'm a man of God. Why are you fouling me? I'm not a man of God. I'm a man You know, that guy is a guy. I even lay hands on him sometimes. But you get on basketball and the guy slaps you. But I don't get intimidated because I'm a man of God. I'm getting the service and followed him. Are you hearing me? You understand? I'm secure. I know who called me. I don't need. 17, I don't, I know what's on me, but no, it doesn't need a special chair, uh -uh. even if you sit me there, I'll sit very well, that's why you see it, eh? we don't have special chairs, because we don't want our glory to be in a certain chair, <laughs> uh -uh. no, I don't need a special chair, give me the mic. Just give me the mic. Somebody shout amen. Just give me the what? The mic. And lastly, if a man is seduced, they're extended into slander. How do you know that a man has been seduced? They start slandering other people. That's how you know that you've been seduced. When you can't help to talk about someone. Now, manyachakuria. Has eaten you. That's why I tell people, how do you avoid the spirit of seduction? Very simple. The moment you sense it, the moment, don't wait to complete the story, however attractive. She got it out. There are people when they start, I tell them, ha, you know, we can have this conversation later. And then I go, some of them, if they overdo it, I sternly just ask them a question. Someone one time came and said, tell me about someone. I asked me, yes, yeah, have you talked to this person about this thing you're telling me? You know. I cut them in the middle. I saw where they were going. 
because the moment I sense seduction, immediately the appearance, bah, you address it. Uh huh. So, did you talk to this person about it? No. So you're telling me to do what? To warn you? Uh, can I go and tell them that you warned me? No. So why shouldn't I tell them? Please don't. Uh -uh, why shouldn't I tell them if you're of the light? The moment someone tells me no, I'm going to talk. Because it's the only way I can enter light. No, you know, let me tell you something. Timothy 4 says, the Spirit speaks distinctively, expressly, and declares that in the latter times, men shall turn away from the faith and give attention to deluding and seducing spirits and doctrines that demons speak. The Spirit has said it. And Paul says in Acts 20 that when he was leaving, when he had finished his work as a minister, in Acts 20, verses 26, he says, I take your record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He tells them, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseer. It is my responsibility to take heed for you. It's the responsibility of every pastor to keep his sheep from wolves. This is what I'm doing. That's why I'm not making a public statement. I am teaching my own. I've not mentioned the name of a ministry or a minister. No, I am trying to pass a point, not an individual. I don't have that time. This altar doesn't fight men. But we must be able to guard our own because God will ask me, did I warn you? This is our responsibility. He made me to oversee you. I owe God an accountability to make sure that I show you the truth. So that if you chose the other way, I have done so. Are you hearing me? Now, the Bible says in verses 29, For I know this, Paul says, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves men shall arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. I have seen this. There are men who don't care about people. They don't care. They don't care. There was a couple I was trying to reconcile. Their marriage was dying last year. And I tried to reconcile them because their marriage was failing. They were married, but their marriage was failing. Okay? And I started counseling this couple. And I started counseling them. And I called the young girl and I said, take this stuff out of your parents and come for counseling. The parents had gotten into. And then someone carried this young lady to a certain ministry. And when they reach that ministry, they ask her, where do you pray from? She tells them, Fanero. They say, eh, 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 that pastor, he has demons, he puts demons in people, la, 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 all that nonsense. The ministry speaking that, people have died in that church when they are casting out devils on them. There are records, countless numbers of people who have died in that church when they are casting out devils from them. A man has never died on my hands when I'm praying. But in their ministry, countless people have died under deliverance. And then they tell this girl, you know, the reason why that marriage is not working, one, you're in the wrong ministry. I'm okay if the two could live and their marriage works. Because that union is of Christ. And two people can't break Fanero. Even today I will get more salvation souls. And they will be replaced immediately. But he goes on to say, and the spirit tells me that the reason why the two of you are not together with that young man, the mother of the young man is doing witchcraft on you. And the Kaful believed it. When I stole the information, I knew that that was a lie. Why? Because I see. And because she was told, she went back to her parents and told them so. And they told the young man, never step here again. A marriage was destroyed. I don't know what some men will tell God. 
a child might grow up and not be raised by his own parents because of a funny man who does not care. Listen, if your marriage is breaking because of this ministry, I would rather your marriage work. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is a guy who came to me a couple of months ago last year. Then he said, the Lord has told me to submit to you. Now he had had a funny past, eh? very sad past. He told me all his stories. I said, let me give him a chance as a father. Because I see that the guy is gifted. I said, let me give him a chance to grow in the church. And one day when he came, my ushers brought him, put him here, in front, he started mingling with us. People started thinking, oh, he's also a man of God because he's with us. But we're trying to love him. Three months, four months, he writes me text messages. You're the man I've been looking for. You're the man of God I wanted. I have looked in this world. Apostle, you don't know. He even cried. After the fourth month, I received a report from people that he's telling them, and now he sees a cult, and now he sees a serpent on the altar, wah, wah, wah. Same. So, four months later, God led you to a serpent to submit. And the next thing I know, he starts calling my church members in secret meetings to teach them. He feels led to impart something in their lives. Now he started building with disciples. Now, trust Fanero people. After he tells them everything, they sit him down doing and tell him, man of God, we are going to report to you. <laughs> no, no, no. He said, no. Why are you speaking about our man of God? Because for me, either God will tell me in a vision, or I'll dream it, or somebody will tell me. People in Fanero hate gossip and slander. Those of you who have just joined this ministry, talk about anyone, they will know. So they said, we are going to report you to the man of God. Pastor, we have also told you. So they come and tell me everything. They show me his WhatsApps. Call me, I ask for proof. I don't base on Roma. I read. And after reading, I tell them, go tell him. I have got to know about it. Just tell him, we have told Apostle. So they tell him. <laughs> One of those Sundays, he comes. This time he sits behind Kovea. The assistant, but you are a student. Oh, no, no. I watch him. Now, after service as usual, he comes in the back. He sees me. Shaking like this. When I come to him, Hey, how are you? I hug it. You're good? Yeah, well done. How's work? Oh, okay, it's good. Well done. Thanks for coming. And I walk out. Mama, he didn't know what to do. Because he knows I know. I have hugged him. I have shaken his hand. I'm happy he has come to church. I knew he was never going to come back again. Some people, you don't need to chase them away with anger. You give them a love that they have to run away from. That's how I chased him out. I knew he was never going to come back. I knew. Because I didn't think he would ever face me again. The guilt in him would never look at me again. A certain way. You understand what I'm saying? Me, I have those ways. I can know somebody is doing something to me. And I love them through. And I either see their deliverance from it, or see their fall on it, but I have enough self-control not to take it on on anyone. I can know and just be at peace. Praise God. And many people like that, you will meet many people who speak one thing, but behind you they are killing you. Kati, don't be so consumed. Yo, yo, how could you? Ah, no. You love them, but make them know you know. But you love them anyway, in their madness. Hallelujah. If they have a ounce of God, they'll repent. If it's not there, this is my heart's prayer for you. And it's going to be short but very important. Father, I pray that we may 
stay followers and lovers of truth that we will weigh everything against truth and that we'll have the wisdom to discern when seduction comes and dealing with it without even hearing because hearing defiles our spirits. It defiled Eve when she listened to the serpent and man fell and death reigned in the earth because a woman took time to listen to seductive spirits. Cause us to know when it's seduction and to hush it before it destroys our destinies. Help us understand what truth is and walk in it. Because a little living will destroy many. In Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, you are not born again. You're going to repeat these words after me from your heart. Say, Jesus, I thank you for today. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. In Jesus' name. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Scenario Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at scenariocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.scenario.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.